Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by members of the network of the European Biomage Analysts, New Bias. Coming up, Kota Mura shares his advice about going freelance with image analysis. But I think I, I don't really recommend to normal people. Uh, when, uh, so I, I'm a bit weird person. I, I confess myself. I mean, <laughs> I'm very optimistic. So uh, so the first thing that to become a freelancer is uh, I think uh, you have to be optimistic. Robert Haza explains why he prefers to invite end users in on the coding process. Why nowadays what we what we do more is like instead of providing a script to people and then hoping that they use it in the right way, that's another topic, um, we write the script together with them. So they learn something um, and then also the next the next project our collaborators want to do, they could potentially do it without us because they acquired the skill. And El Naz Fazeli shares how new bias image analysis school helped her through a tough period in her PhD. In the middle of my PhD, I was actually um, stuck. I was doing a lot of microscopy. I started with dead, so quite deep. But um, then I couldn't analyze so well. I mean, everything was manual and time consuming. So that's when I got to hear about new bias. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from University of York and welcome to this episode of The Microscopist. Today we have three, not one, not two, but three guests. So we have Elnaz Pseli from Turku, we have Robert Hazer from Germany, Dresden, and we have Kota Mura, who's freelance. Uh, Kota, where are you living at the moment? I'm in Japan now. Yeah. Right, so different time zone again. So I, I remember yeah, yeah, folks, uh, oh, back in possibly 2002, 2003, when you were at EMBL. 2000, I think. Uh, so were you in uh, Elmi in Paris? I wasn't. No, I, my first one was uh, Gothenburg. Okay. And then maybe later. Then. But I, I, I kind of very strong impression I have about, about Peter is uh, this. The one that you organized, Elmi, in 2000, when was it? Uh, 2006 or seven. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> you had a, you know, quite a gorgeous lineup of beers from uh, local beers. And then uh, there was a hush puppy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, somehow I had an impression that all these beers, uh, they have a name after Docks. <laughs> well, that was it. Yorkshire Terrier and uh, yeah, there was Yorkshire Terrier there. Yeah, yeah, that that was it. Uh, so uh, that kind of made me strong impression about you because you were proudly presenting all this beer on the stage. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe your impressions of me are not about size but about beer. I think that's <laughs> no, no. I I already said it was a first impression, you know. So afterward, you became like a hero. I know, but <laughs> the first thing I recognized about you was uh, strongly associated with these beer, you know. Yeah, That's cool. And, uh, Kota, I'm going to bring this back up later because I might have one or two photos from that meeting. Uh, but ah. I, I will come to that <laughs> in a little bit. I, I, I hope it's not too bad. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, they're yeah, atrocious. Yeah. I'm sure Robert and Elnaz are going to really enjoy seeing them. Uh, <laughs> right. So we should we should get on to the topic of today. So today's slightly different. We're going to focus on new bias. Uh, so actually, who would like to explain what new bias actually stands for to start with? Uh, shall I, I, Elnaz, okay, you I, I can. Sure, Potter, go for <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, yeah. So we named Novius. New BS. I mean, uh, so it's uh, the network of European bioimage analysts, and then uh, it comes with the history of uh, how we started naming courses. So that uh, the initial course that was in uh, the EMBO uh, courses, um, this is called 
uh, I, I think it was na the name was uh, um, the master course for bioimage data analysis. And then uh, I, we started to abbreviate as a bias, bioimage analysis. Uh, and then, uh, and then, so there was, uh, um, so that was 2012, I think, that we named it. And then after this, um, we use this bias often for, uh, as a kind of a um, convention to just name things bias, bias. Or, and then uh, there was a European Biomedical Analysis Symposium, which was in Barcelona. And this was called EU bias. So uh, EU bias. Or, and then um, this was because uh, we kind of uh, inherited the original course contents and then make it shorter a bit, but um, with more people in the sense. And then this was UBS. Then at this time we didn't have money and then we started looking for getting money. And then now uh, we got money from uh, EU cost, cost EU. Yeah. And then uh, for this project, we added N in the beginning of EU bias, and then there's no BS. And then uh, many people think that it somehow comes from a German, new, uh, which is annoying, uh, but it's not really uh, true. <laughs> we try to edit, make some additions. And then now we are trying to go for Sobias, which is still, uh, um, we haven't, it's a hypothetical name still, but the project name is Sobias, which is Society for Biomedical Analysis. So uh, we kind of um, stopped adding more <laughs> rather than we chopped off the beginning and then uh, now it's Sobias. So the reason for going for Sobias is to bring in the rest of the world, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. So that's <laughs> now the led by Robert, who is sitting here now. <laughs> and it was actually it was actually a hot discussion if, uh, how how we can call it i can't i can't rec i can't recall all the names we had in mind but there was also the network of bioimage analysts no bias and then there was a glow bias and then we were thinking about so <laughs> of course you know how zoom meetings go you have something like 50 people in a zoom meeting and of course we find the consensus <laughs> So um, the, the final name is not decided. It's a working title, um, Zobaya. And I would say that we are now planning to found a society to become an actual um, body with like um, a legal entity uh, with a cost center and these kind of things so that we can also acquire funding ourselves and do not have to rely on host organizations. And when we, when we found this thing, then we have to have a name. So we can now go through the process of writing down our 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 internal guidelines, our rules, um, our uh, governance model, and with that we also have to figure out how we want to call ourselves. <laughs> Ideally, it is something where everybody feels welcome who analyzes images from microscopy uh, biomedical context. So, who who were the founding member? Who whose idea was it to start this in the first instance? Who were the original? Or figureheads to kick this off. The first Which person was... I've ever talked to was Julian Columbelli, who had this idea. But Kota, you may know better. So, um, so this was um, you you know that so it actually comes from Elmi. Um, so uh, uh, so it was already after we started this uh um, a bias course. I mean. Uh, but this for this course, Julian was not involved. But then, um, I think there was a meet Elmi meeting in uh, Boldo. In so there was a two times Boldo meeting, and then the one that was earlier, I think, which was very bad weather or something. Do you remember this? Uh, yeah, I've been to the. Well, I remember Bordeaux very well. Uh, yeah. Where, so where uh, the next one? Do, do you re so so we when was this? So I forgot. But the two thousand, I think. 14 or 14 or something like this okay. right and then uh so that uh i wasn't there for i think uh um at this point i have a lot of family problem i mean uh, not problem but uh, i was busy with family things and then uh i wasn't really i stopped going to elmi to save my time 
And then, uh, um, but then, so I always hear a lot of this, uh, what happened in Elmi at this, <laughs> around that time. The people just come to me and say, oh, there was this and that in Elmi and so on. And then this time, so um, actually, Julian called me directly after he went back to Barcelona. I think it was a call. And then uh, saying that um, there was some, um, many people asked, um, we have to start some kind of uh, um, network with biomage analysis. And then, uh, so, and then Julia said that, um, so I think you have some idea about this. So that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so um, the initial thing that um, I proposed to do was to write a short um, um, text about the plan of how this network should be and then uh, how the meeting of this biomage analysis should be. And then, and then so um, I wrote the draft of uh, the kind of this uh, skeleton of how the meeting should be. And then this should be combined. So there was already this idea of uh, making a, a multiplex meeting of courses and a symposium and also, so uh, this Tagathon actually came after, but combining this uh, symposium and courses. So that wasn't like, a, so this is uh, um, the text that um, I wrote. And then the, the main point was this, so that uh, um, while there are many meetings about uh, software, yeah, so at this time, actually, so there was a still image J symposium, which was held um, every year between Europe and United States. But uh, so it's alternate the, uh, the place. And then, uh, so I was there several times for this image meeting. And what I felt was that they always only talk about software. Yeah. So but they don't talk about biomage analysis. So that's a kind of a, for me, it was a different because if I went to image meeting and I was kind of a, became a bit disappointed. So I was very excited to meet like uh, Wayne Rasband and all the plugin stars. Huh? But then uh, they, but they only talk about these individual, how plugin works and how to use them, but never really talk about the analysis itself, which is what I'm interested in. So, that, uh, so I was kind of half satisfied, 50%. So that, uh, it's not full excitement. It's like a 50% meeting actually like, uh, um, um, Zafield and, uh, Pribish. <laughs> so, so those, those, you know, or Johannes Schindelin or, uh, Albert Cardone who made, uh, the, the Fiji. Yeah? Yeah. So meeting them was exciting and hearing how they made it was um, amazing. But, so I had this missing part, which is about image analysis itself, which I always hear some of them in like the Elmi meeting or uh, in uh, cell biology meetings, where you actually have some biological problem and then trying to tell how they solve using image analysis as a kind of major tool for uh, measuring something. And I wanted to have a meeting where really specifically only talk about this, what I'm interested in. So that uh, the major message of this text was, okay, let's do some courses that are actually centered on this biolog biological image analysis, yeah? not only about plugins and how the software architecture is and then how the algorithm. It's rather that more centered on how we measure various aspects. <laughs> so, so, Based on this idea, Julian Colombelli and Sebastian Toshi made a lot of um, feedbacks on this draft. Okay, so we can do this and do that. And then, so one, one thing that um, came up during this uh, um, discussion, which was very informal, we, so I, I don't know how we did it even now. At this time, we didn't have Zoom. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Maybe it was a phone conversation because uh, Julian and uh, Sebastian Toshi are sitting together. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so, so like uh, the idea of this uh, bioimage information index uh, was came in there while we were discussing. So, that, uh, so 
we need to somehow organize tools. Yeah. So but, uh, the one important message we had another one besides this uh, um, um, to uh, explore biomedical analysis as a biological um, interest. So that's number one. But second is that the second message that um, while many people say that, um, um, so if you see those uh, plugin papers, it's always that there is no tool doing this. Yeah. So we have a very, uh, or it can be that we have a more faster processing or more precise processing, or we have a more functional um, with um, more functionalities and so on. But I think, so So what at this point, so what we thought was that, no, 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 there are too many tools. Yeah. It's actually, so almost on like uh, every day we see some new tools appearing. And then, uh, so that, uh, it's rather that we want to know what is already there, right? And then, so what is already there and then also that what they can do. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, Kota, how long did it put, how long, roughly how long, one year, two years, three years to put this together and get the funding and start it? How, how, how long did it take, the total effort? So, we, so, it, so the text is in the GitHub. So it's called, uh, um, um, but yeah, for, from the time yeah. that Julian called after that Elmi meeting to the point of actually having the first new bias meeting where people came together and talked about how it's going to move forward and everything. Once you got funding, how long did that take? Was it one year, two years, three years? That's yeah. I, 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 okay. So, so I think, so, so that was a proposal. Then we started meeting. Uh, which actually was the UBS, yeah. So you started then, it before the funding start. You you were doing it even before the funding, anyway. And so the there was yeah yeah, but events. but but the UBS was uh, partially funded by Eurobioimaging, actually. I think uh, so because um, um, Jason Sledlow was a big supporter. He actually Jason talked to Julian, and uh, so the several people talked to him. But um, that uh, so Kota should do something together with you or something. Right? <laughs> and, uh, well, that's how so... it all kicked off at the start. So I've got to just just to move this on a little bit. I've got to ask, when did Robert Robert? When did you come into this? And then Alan, as I'm going to come to you and ask exactly the same question, when did you come into this? I'm actually also looking forward to learn when Elna exactly joined, because I think I don't know this story yet. <laughs> um, so I, oh, joined, yeah, 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 probably. I joined in 2017 in Lisbon as a student. Um, I was in the bioimage analysis training school and Julian was in Dresden before told us about it and one of us should come. So that's why I came there as a student and I was completely amazed because until this point, I was sitting as a co-facility engineer in a co-facility and I was, I felt pretty isolated. And then I was sitting with like 25 other pretty isolated core facility engineers in a room together. Um, and it was like, wow, there's other people who have exactly the same problem I have. And it was like super amazing. Um, and I was then, I think a year later, I was trainer in one of those schools. And another year later, I was then the scientific organizer of these schools. And then another year later, I started with others together writing proposals for extended funding. Um, here, one important lesson in this, in this all this, how this came things together context, the grant we have now, the money which, which we can spend now for hiring a community manager who will start in a month, by the way, um, we wrote three proposals to get that. So we had like multiple attempts that we had to do it again and again and not give up and do it again. <laughs> and eventually we got this money. So, but it was, this was a two year process, pretty much the entire pandemic. We had two meetings again and again, and then writing a proposal for this one and writing a proposal for that one. And eventually we got some money to hire this community manager. But Elnas, how did you join us? I really would Please, like Elnas, to know. When, when did you join you guys? You, you're the youngest one here, I think. Yeah, I consider myself a second or third generation here because Kota was there from the beginning. And I think at the point where you had the Elmi meeting and everything, I wasn't even in a, a bioimaging context. Um, I was an electrical engineer, actually, <laughs> designing PCBs and, you know, programming with C++ microcontrollers and stuff like that. 
So, uh, yeah, but in 2012, I came uh, to Finland and I did a master's in biomedical imaging. And that's where I got to know microscopes and how cool they are. And that's when it all started for me. Um, then I continued to do a PhD here also in Turku, Finland. And um, in the middle of my PhD, I was actually um, stuck. <laughs> I was doing a lot of microscopy. I started with STED. So quite deep, but um, then I couldn't analyze so well. I mean, everything was manual and time consuming. So that's when I got to hear about new bias. And my first new bias uh, encounter was in 2019 um, when I went to, I think it was Luxembourg for um, image analyst school. So I was a trainee there. <laughs> and uh, there were mainly also programmers and hardcore people. Also, Robert was teaching there with the uh, with his post-it notes and <laughs> Kota and Julian and others. And I really, really loved it. So I was like, yeah, I I have to just keep pushing and keep learning more. Um, the next year, uh, in 2020, I was uh, organizing and uh, teaching in already in um early career school in Bordeaux and that was when COVID was starting and they weren't sure what it is and what's happening <laughs> so the moment that I landed back in Finland all the borders closed and then COVID started and the pandemic started and so um we continued I was helping organizing the new bias academy at home um webinars at that point and I was very active then with new bias and continued uh, connecting with people and meeting and uh, volunteering to participate and help as much as I could. And um, at the same time, I also got a job in 2021 and moved to Helsinki to biomedical imaging unit. So that was actually pretty good because then I also needed to improve still my own image analysis knowledge. I had to help users with that as well and microscopy um so yeah when there was the fun funding calls then i helped and finally we got uh new uh, the ccdi funding so i was very excited to be part of that and now so actually of, of all of this covid for all the negatives it has created new opportunities and enabled you probably given you a little bit more time in those early stages to actually put the to get together better as a network, exactly. to look at new ways of working and to put those proposals together, uh, which is really cool. And it's interesting to hear how you got into it. Uh, and Robert, I presume similarly, how did you get, what was your first degree? Maybe I should ask that to all of you. So Kota, what was your first degree? Um, so I, my, my undergraduate is, yeah. um, so this is called a Bachelor of Liberal Arts. <clears throat> Bachelor of arts. Liberal Arts. Liberal Arts. That's a curve. Liberal Arts. Liberal Arts is, uh, I mean, uh, it's, uh, um, so you know Liberal Arts, right? It's a no. Liberal Arts College. So uh, I studied um, biology and philosophy. <clears throat> so, so how to, I, I'll come back to this. So I'm going to, go, I'm going to just go around the table to find out what everyone did is there first. Uh, Elna, your your undergraduate electronics, electronics, yes, <clears throat> electrical and electronics engineering. Yeah, love it. And Robert, so I I did it. I did it a little bit longer way of education before achieving my master's in Germany. It's called the second way of education. You first do a formal training and a job in a. Thing, and then you enter university when you are much older. So I am a software developer, a programmer by training. And then afterwards, I uh, did a master's in um, uh, computer science. <laughs> I, wanted, you know, I wanted to do something different. Um, and then I did uh, at the medical faculty at the University in Dresden a PhD in oh, what's the technical a technical physician or something like that. So it's medicine, some form of medicine, but obviously from the technical perspective. So none of your careers, are, or maybe coached to an extent, are directly into life sciences to start with. Uh, and Kota, you you were. So Kota, I, I first got to know you probably 
2003, 2002, 2003, Semmering, uh, no, not Semmering, uh, Gothenburg, uh, when you started at EMBL, uh, or not long after you started at EMBL. What drew you to EMBL, just briefly? What, what, what was the attraction? Why, why that role? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's actually, um, so, you know, Jens Sweetdorf. Yeah, of course I know Jens. And, uh, Timo Timmerman. You know them. Uh, uh, Timo, so they they are my heroes. Yeah, so they are from the same lab in Munich where I was. So it was a very small lab. It's actually only, only us uh, working on the cellular slime mold, Dicti. Yeah. And then, uh, so we were intensively using, um, we were making microscope, I mean, we were converting microscopes, using microscopes. So at this time, Confoca was very fancy. And then, so Jens moved to Heidelberg, who, and then, uh, in, I think 1998 or something. And then, uh, so he was working in a different lab, but initially, but then he started working with Rhino Pepper Polk in some, something in between two, 1998 and, uh, 2001, somewhere between. And then, because then Jens Ritov started the world first advanced light microscope facility in the world. So this was the, the first one. Huh? The facility, yeah, and then facility concept came from uh, this uh, inside envelope, and then Rhino was responsible for making it, and then Yes actually um, did a lot of these practical things, and on the way he called Timo <laughs> in Munich uh, because he was uh, about to finish his PhD and said, "Timo, could you help me?" And then Timo moved to Heidelberg from Munich. Then after this, they were saying that Kota, you should come as well, and so on. But then uh, um, I was not really, um, I, I wanted to keep on doing some uh, project that was working on the PhD and then do it in my postdoc time. But then um, the Yes told me that, oh, Kota, there's a very good 3D time lapse microscopy that you can do in Munich, uh, Embo. Like, you can use it. And then so I, I drove my old Golf 2 with uh, samples and equipment, uh, some for special imaging, to Heidelberg. And then uh, so Timo said that, oh, I have an extra room. So that, uh, I just put my things there and then slept for one week, stay there, do some experiment. Then I said that up. Uh, and Raya was already, you know, um, very welcoming me to do some experiments with this facilities things. But then, uh, so I needed another week or something. And I said, ah, so I need another week. And then, um, right. I said, no, no problem. You can stay as much as you want. And then that kind of, um, very ambiguous start. And then I started to stay in Embo. And then, so at some point I got some money from Japan to support my uh, research in Embo. And then, uh, and then I started to stay in Heidelberg. But a very long time, I was just living in this uh, um, Timo's flat, uh, share room, uh, not really determined to stay in Heidelberg or not. But eventually, it became really serious uh, to be in uh, work as an Embo postdoc. And then eventually, as a, from 2005, I became the image analysis expert. So that was the way it went. So that's how you got into that, and then the image analysis started. Uh, Elnaz, how, how did you move? So you went to your, you went through, you went to your healthy, but why image analysis? Why not stay with the, the imaging or the scientific question? Why move to the analysis? It was from the user point of view. I was myself stuck. Um, I had lots of images. I, I was having so much fun spending hours um, you know, in the dark room and, and looking at my samples under microscopes and just taking pictures. And I was getting to the point that I was taking pictures for others as well. And uh, not just with one modality, but with multiple. I mean, I've got my hands on EM, uh, confocal, super resolution, light sheet, and then AFM and all kinds of stuff. So I needed to then deliver more. Um, and I needed to kind of get 
numbers out of these pretty pictures that I was getting. And I didn't know how to do that. So um, that's when I realized that I think it's time for me to, to move on. Like microscopy is great. I love it. That's why I chose a job in a core facility. And um, I, I really, really enjoy doing it, but I don't think it's enough. Um, you have to then then move on from it as well. At some point, it's a, it becomes your comfort zone and the learning curve gets flat and then you get bored. And I'm one of those people that when I'm get, getting bored, then I, I'm not motivated to, to do really efficiently my job anymore. So, so image analysis is something that I'm not comfortable doing. And it's really, really like hard for me to, um, uh, get grasped with when it comes to all these new techniques that keep coming with this super fast speed. Like when I started machine learning and deep learning, okay, it was there, but normal, I mean, uh, everyday biologists wouldn't need it necessarily for the analysis, but nowadays it's coming more and more. So anyways, I find it really exciting. It keeps me on my toes and uh, I love it. And I, I also like, um, staying in the image analysis field because of the people. I love the community and I'm a sociable person. I like uh, the communications aspect of it. So that's why um, it kind of it, it attracts me because people are so nice and they're very helpful and they're very open. And you're talking about fair and open and reproducible and they're, they're all down my alley. So yeah, it's been a, a really nice journey. It is a good area to be in at the moment. Uh, which, which we'll come to later because it hasn't always been the case. As in, and, and as Robert, you mentioned earlier, you had to write three grants to get funding to start with. So although it's a, I wouldn't say it's an emerging area anymore. I'd say it's an area that is very much here. But getting funding has now become, went from being very difficult to now being just as difficult as any other proposal in the area. But at least that's better than what it was. Robert, how did you migrate into life sciences even and into and why image analysis well you comp science but how did you hook into the wanting to work with life sciences and solving the help help develop solving problems it started with the data so when i was when i when i was a student when i studied computer science you know you learn pretty much everything about uh, computer science and there was one thing which was very fascinating for me uh, which was a three-dimensional image data um, because there's like plenty of algorithms, computer vision, detecting trees and stuff. This, this research field is decades old. Um, but when you think of three-dimensional image data, there is much less. And the big question is which or how can we translate algorithms for two-dimensional data into a three-dimensional space? And it's like a big data problem. And when I started in that, it was like something like 2008. Um, big data was something like half a gigabyte. <laughs> it was really challenging to process this kind of data on the computers back in the days. And this is how I came into a research center, a cancer research center here in Dresden, where I was for multiple years the only computer scientist who was working there, first as a student assistant, later as a PhD student. So I was helping everybody in this institute with their image analysis very naturally, because, you know, I was one of the people who could program. There were also some physicists who were doing similar things, so there was also a small community, but I was the only software engineer slash computer scientist. And then when I finished my PhD, I was in the neighbor building actually an open position for a bioimage analyst. Uh, I think they called it a bioimage informatician back in the days um, in a core facility. So I immediately after my PhD went into this position and it also became permanent at some point. So I had a permanent position in uh, actually a company which was working within a research institute. And now comes the fun fact. Um, I learned again, I, I mentioned it earlier in my first new bias school, I learned that there are more people who have similar problems um, and there are multiple approaches for solving these problems. So I did not agree with how the problems were approached in the in the in the department i was working in so thanks to new buyers half a year after that school i quit my permanent position <laughs> it was really like for me it was so so exciting to to meet all these people and see how we can communicate and i was we were discussing a lot about open science and sharing stuff and that was not the strategy of the group i was working in and that's why i quit and today i'm head of such a department and we are working in a different way we share things openly and it is 
possible. So that's, it's, it's very exciting to see how these different approaches for running a core facility, for running a group in bioimage analysis work. And as you just said, it, today is very different ways possible to, to get funding for these kind of opportunities, for these kind of things. And to me, it's yet unclear which is the right approach. Many approaches work, many are financially possible, um, but it's not so clear. You cannot say the best way for running a core facility is like that. It's like, it's just, we don't know. It's, the field is too young. I, yeah, I, I think for microscopy core, there's good things, but for image, it, for, for any type of analysis, actually, not just imaging mm -hmm. analysis, I'd say for genomic, metabolomic, proteomic analysis, actually the, the models are not well established. Yeah, yes, and, and I think it probably fits your location, your funding mm -hmm. potential. <clears throat> but yeah, it's one. Well, actually, I think it's one of the hardest areas to cost recover and to develop is in the image is in the analysis arena of, of developing that. Because <clears throat> as an analogy, you're like lawyers. You know, your time has to be paid for. You have to recover a salary. I mean, Kota, you're now freelance, so she's blatantly obvious but in the academic world it's more hard because we, we're so used to collaborating just talking for free and helping but that time costs and you know if you're using uh if you, i don't know if you're doing something physical and you pay someone to make a protein or spend hours on a on, on an instrument it's clear what you're doing with them but in the case of image analysis it's far more amorphous it's not you don't see it in real time as much uh and, it, and it's how long is a piece of string you know it's hard to guess, work out or estimate how long a piece of work is going to take. So it there's does. Actually, make... There's actually a risk also related to that. So what I think what I've done kind of wrong in the early days when I was working in this field, um, we basically only sent a script to the people who were requesting our support. So they, what they see is the final result, and they see a twenty line script. So a twenty line script. So I think. Robert may have written that in an afternoon, so it cannot have been so expensive. That also leads later when it comes to who can actually, who should be co-author on this on this paper. Ah, yeah, Robert just wrote 20 lines of script. It, it's not such a big <laughs> contribution, right? But if I was sitting there for two weeks, figuring out how to do this, and then eventually wrote 20 lines of script, um, so the, 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 the actual work is not visible to the outside. There's a big risk here. That's why nowadays what we what we do more is like instead of providing a script to people and then hoping that they use it in the right way, that's another topic, um, we write the script together with them. So they learn something. Um, and then also in the next the next project our collaborators want to do, they could potentially do it without us because they acquired the skills. So we are now more on a teaching endeavor, teaching the tools to the people and showing helping helping them to help themselves. And that allows us also to do more advanced projects in the future. So this is the, basically the strategy here behind. And then also gaining co-authorships by, I was co-supervising this person in this data analysis task um, works much better, much easier to justify because we understand each other better. I understand better how the biological question has to be interpreted and the biologist um, interpre uh, understands much better how the data analysis is actually working and which are the screws you can tune and which not. I think, I think that's a really, I, you know, sometimes we take sound bites out of these podcasts and that's a really important one <laughs> um, <laughs> because I think that's a really good way to, to make sure your efforts, anyone's efforts is actually appreciated because it, you're right. I think that's the same Again, if you're taking a microscope image, I know as you've been doing the microscopy and you may do the microscopy for someone and you give them back an image, which is seconds. But the amount of optimization, troubleshooting, designing the experiment to get to that point, which is a super simple image, can be a long time. And, and I think people can appreciate that because people get hands on with the microscope. And so they quite often pass it over because it's beyond their skill sets. If it gets really complicated or ask for help, but you're right, scripting, they just pass it into, you know, into your cells and it becomes a black box and just comes back out. And they, I think it's really good what you just said about involving them, showing them, training them so they understand how hard it is. And Kota, you do this freelance. How that's a brave step to step out of the world of academia where you have a paid salary to go completely freelance. How big a gamble was that? But I think I, I don't really recommend to normal people. I mean, uh, so I, I'm a bit weird person. I, I confess myself. I mean, 
<laughs> I'm very optimistic. So, uh, so the first thing that to become a freelancing is uh, I think uh, you have to be optimistic <laughs> because you cannot expect salary at all. So, uh, so I think uh, the point that you were mentioning about this, uh, so how actually bioimage analysts work with uh, biological academia. I mean, uh, so, so the first point is that I think bioimage analysis is part of academia, which is so uh, research. So uh, it's very difficult to recognize um, from biology biologists that um, doing some scripting uh, would be uh, academic activity because so you may just making software. Um, how can it be uh, science, something like this? So that's not true. And then uh, there's a different types of software, but uh, um, uh, so that uh, um, the software that you buy, like Adobe Photoshop or Microsoft Word, you can buy and use it. And then uh, so that that is not so. Let's say that when you write um, some paper, you definitely need some editor, and then one of them is Microsoft Word. You're using Microsoft Word, but you don't ask Microsoft Word people, so would you want to be a co-author? <laughs> but uh, in that sense, software is something that's really a tool like a pencil. You know? So if you don't acknowledge the, the name of the pencil uh, maker in the paper, because you just use that pencil for like, writing the academic paper, right? So, but in case of this scientific software, it matters more, but of course, there's a kind of a um, um, gradient of uh, um, how important the specific name of involvement of certain software and author is in terms of scientific uh, outcome. But um, in case of the scientific uh, software, I think it does matter. And then uh, you cannot treat them like uh, Microsoft Word or Adobe Photoshop because it matters with the precision of your measurements. So uh, you write the name of the instrument, whichever you use for uh, scientific uh, research, for example, so you, you definitely would name the company name of the microscopes, right? Size or Leica or Olympus doesn't exist anymore. I don't know, but... Uh, um, um, Nikon or uh, other yeah. companies, right? So because well, it matters with the precision of your measurement. And then likewise, software that you use for image analysis has importance because of the precision that you're doing and the algorithm that you're using for treating numbers. So uh, um, in a similar way that um, when you are involved uh, in the research from the side of this image analysis, there's a difference in the, um, how you commit to that certain question. So that if you are committed just to provide, so uh, how about you can use this software just to measure your whatever. So I think you don't have to be even acknowledged for uh, doing that. But uh, if you are involved in writing something, yeah. You know, uh, computer code, even uh, not even uh, um, five lines. I, was, I mean, uh, robot said twenty lines, but even five lines. I think it matters with the whole project. And then there's a much more deeper involvement. For example, so you discuss with the person, <coughs> biologist, biologist, and bio, bio, biologist talking, discussing about the uh, question. And then you start to say that, oh, maybe we can measure this and have such a parameter there. The biologist said, oh, that might be a good idea. Yeah. So the, what I was often doing in Nembo was that talking like this, and then you write on a piece of paper, sometimes in the canteen on a piece of uh, uh, napkins, paper napkins, and I, okay, maybe you can plot it like this and like that. And then for whatever the treatment, it might go down in this part like this, and then you can see the difference, maybe statistically, and then you get the results. So that is the involvement, right? 
then you actually um, enlighten the person to do some research. And then there's an even deeper one, huh? remodeling the experiment still. Let's say that the person is taking a long time last movie trying to figure out the difference in situation A and B, right? And then, so uh, the person come up to you and say that, okay, so we're taking this time lapse and we want to analyze this time lapse movie so that we want to see if there is any difference yeah, with this and that. Okay, so I tell you, then, then I would answer, but so I'm looking at all those uh, um, um, time lapse movies and it's not saying that I think you don't have to do time lapse movie. You can just do two time points. The first one and the second one, and then compare the situation like this in very precise manner, and that, that would be give you a much better result. And I said, Oh, that's true. Uh, I don't have to do time lapse microscopy. Right? And then, then you do the experiment, and then you come back again and then do the analysis and get some results. In this case, there's a kind of, you know, this kind of interaction that is uh, going, making something new, creating new value. In that case, you're really involved. So, Even so if, how, yeah. how do you, yeah. when you quote for this type of work, do oh, okay, you, okay, you quote per day, per hour, per day, or for a fixed job. It depends. So that uh, so I I stopped really working on uh, the real basic uh, difficult research because then I cannot even quote. But uh, the the problem might so you so you, you you have a data and then you see it and uh, so it might take two days to just to want to get some results, but eventually this can potentially become really long. It can take yeah. like half a year or something because uh, there's a new issues troubleshooting and so on, and then there's a small difference which actually happened to be the very important. Question. So when you quote this, yeah, you cannot really quote. But uh, um, I, I actually made several um, um, mistakes that way uh, when I quoting. Uh. So that uh, um, I quote when it becomes like an. Um, I mean, I'm really sure that I can so do this in like a certain period of time. Then I quote. Otherwise, I say that okay. So that. I cannot really expect the time duration of the process, but uh, it might take infinite amount of money. Do you agree? And if person agrees, I would just start without quote. And then uh, just say that, okay, so I work like uh, um, such a amount of uh, time, effort, so that uh, could you pay me like this? So and, that invoicing. Um, yeah. And who, just, just very quickly, who are your main clients? Is it academia? or industry so it changed so initially it was a lot of this uh, academia but as i said it becomes really ambiguous but i now tend to prefer to work with companies because uh, of uh, the it's much more clear with their goal okay normally yeah yeah, I, I, yeah. I, which is why i envisaged probably to start with but i think it's fascinating that it can be done in academia and i think that's that's good i have some quick really quick fire questions so unmute your mics for those who are unmuted. Um, what, what is it? So I'm going to start with Elnaz. What was the first microscope you used? It was a SP5 Leica STED. Okay. And Kota, what was your first microscope? The first microscope? Yep. So uh, this is 1992. I was using... Um, Olympus, I forgot, uh, it was a really, it was the first video microscope I used, still this videotape, which is custom made and then uh, uh, set up. But I, I I really don't forgot the name of the uh, the microscope Modern. I used for this. So it wasn't confirmed, it was just, yeah. that's just going to be wide field fluorescence, potentially. Yes. If that's, and yes. tape, so probably yes. an IX, yes. what was before the IX, yeah. it was about 1990. Yeah, so, so, so I was taking um, um, microtubules, thick samples. And then, uh, this was already high tech. Yeah. And Robert, what about yourself? 
That's a tough question. I cannot recall the vendor, but certainly I got as a kid from my father, from my parents, I got a microscope for kids. And I that was maybe at an age of 12 or 13 or something like that. And a decade later, I found it again and I tried to mount a camera on it. <laughs> and I think I failed. it. <laughs> Oh, wait, does the kids' uh, memories count too? <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't go there. I, I, no. I can imagine what the Toys R Us microscopes were really like. No, no, it was a real sun culture microscope and I checked the um, bacterial dishes under it, but it, I was, I think, six, so. Ah, six? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. My mother is in the diagnostics uh, lab. Uh, field, ah, so, yeah. hence the link through to it. <laughs> okay, next quick fire question. I'm going to start with Kota. Image J or Napari? Image J, Image J. Image J? Yeah, Image J. I don't know Napari yet, so, so well. <laughs> Robert? Well, Napari. <laughs> these, <laughs> these days, Napari, yes. <laughs> Hey, and you have two two of your fellow guests here have just said image J. Are you? Are you, uh, are you... <laughs> I mean, I was I was using image J for 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 something like seven or eight years, right? And just to explain this a little bit, um, when I became group leader, it was pretty clear that you cannot hire Java developers like Fitchy plugin developers on the job market. Zero chance. Um, but you can hire Python people. And that's why we are a group of Python developers who make Napari plugins. Which is the key difference between ImageJ and Napari is the, the programming language for which. Right. And how long, so I, I actually, I uh, met with uh, Yannis Tinevez recently. And he's obviously very still ImageJ because he's not, he, although he's getting into Python a bit now. How long do you think it will be before we migrate everything from ImageJ into Python and Napari? Everything um, will, it will take, happen eventually. It will take forever to have everything, like just from a perspective. Do you, do you not see something like ChatGPT enabling that to happen? Still, people have to do it. Um, I would say the majority of the tools which we love in ImageJ are already available in Napari and the Python ecosystem. So you can transition. Um, but it's still very different between these two platforms and potentially may stay for a while. It's the installation process. The image J Fitchy, you download and it works. With Napari, you have to struggle with Conda environments and have to with dependencies and these kind of things. Um, I'm afraid it will stay like that for a while because there might not be an easy technical solution to that. We need a social solution and the social solution might be better training. This dependency problem and that software becomes more complicated um, over the years is like unavoidable. The, we are living in the 21st century and the computational revolution is still happening. It's not like that everything is done. So it may become more complicated and the only way to deal with that is better training. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, for writing, for scripting where you are, yes. For the end user, you know, which is, someone like me who's not into programming at all it's probably the interface and that being a very uh single common common type of interface uh, which could really be have anything in the background as long as it's very user friendly which i guess is one of the big challenges is making those scripts into well 20 line scripts making them as user friendly as possible and as least complex to, to enable it to be widely uptaken so how do you how do you publicize what you do? How do you actually ensure that you've done that 20 line script, uh, five line script quota? How do you make sure that your users, uh, the wider users, not just the users you've done it for, but how, how does it get known by other people to be picked up? How do you publicize it? Uh, who wants to pick that up first? Maybe I'll ask, uh, come to yourself. How do you make sure, not just internally, not just at Turkey, but how do you make sure the wider community across the world know that it's available and what it's capable of? Uh, the code that we write, or we actually don't write code necessarily. I, I mean, I'm coming from the core facility perspective, so it's a bit different maybe than Robert and, and Kota, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's the training and awareness um, that makes a huge difference. Like 
if somebody doesn't know what's happening, if it's a black box, then of course, they don't also know the effort that comes into it. Um, but then if they know, uh, at least to some extent, um, I think that that's the key point, the turning point. So get the so, core facilities to know about it and get them to then... Uh, yes, and also users kind of... Won't be scoping. So I guess it's now down to you or me uh, in the core facility to make sure the users know it exists and exactly. we offer the solutions. But we need to know that that solution exists. So... Kota, how do you make sure I know it exists? So um, there's a different level of this uh, specificity and generality. But uh, um, there's a general tools that can be up, used for many different purposes. And there's a very specific tools that is really focused on some specific question, right? And then uh, for those very uh, narrow bandwidth uh, application, um, it probably can use only once uh, for that specific question and then not at all for everything. And then, so there are some very general tools, for example, auto threshold, right? Auto threshold can be used in many different applications and then usable, it's a generic in a sense. Yeah. So that, uh, and then we shouldn't consider them all as a single type of tool. It's rather that there's a different grade level scale of this uh, generality and specificity. So for those two, that are very general. Yeah. So we can advertise a lot, put it everywhere as much as possible and then do it. But uh, for those very specific application, I think the use case in the future would be uh, almost zero, right? But it doesn't have much meaning to uh, advertise or tell other people that we did this. It's rather <laughs> that it's going to be in the biological paper, say that we use this script. Um, yeah, actually, it's, 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 and, it is that then. It is the biological publication that then helps disseminate it to, if there was anyone else, it's going to be someone who's reading that paper that it becomes yes. relevant to. That's yes, it's, yes. It's so yeah, yeah. Still, and then, so that, that was uh, how I was initially trying to find out uh, how people doing image analysis. So after you read biological paper, there's a method section. And if you're lucky enough, you can find a script, right? <laughs> and then, uh, there was no GitHub before. Uh, so people are not used to publishing those uh, pipelines. So, uh, I mean, so biological paper was the media you know, for this image analysis. Uh, I, I it's been, you... and then it still is. Yeah, I think it still is. And it's a good point about GitHub giving access to it. And we've got our A plus GitHub superstar. I, I looked at your GitHub stats yesterday, Robert, which are uh, <laughs> very high as an A plus GitHub contributor. I don't know if that's the right term to use. Well, whatever that might mean. <laughs> yes. Um, right. But I, 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 anything else to add? I, we, we actually have four minutes left. So anyone who's doing their exercising or ironing right now while listening to the to this, I've got a feeling it might take a bit more than four minutes because I've got a couple of killer bits I want to bring in still. Uh, Robert, is there anything can, you'd like to add for the dissemination and yes. of information? <laughs> we can come, I, I would like to come also back where the discussion started. I think new buyers and slow buyers play the key role here in this context because many of us, in particular, the people who work in the core facilities, we are developing similar things at the same time. Like, how many scripts have been written for counting nuclei? I'm afraid it's billions of custom scripts for this particular purpose. So by by us meeting each other on new buyers training schools, on new buyers symposia, we actually learn that other people do similar things. So we don't have to do it ourselves anymore. We can just come back to the resources the others develop. So that was like a key also for me personally, when I joined this community, that was key for, for the success of new buyers. And that's why we also wrote something about that in the Zobias proposal. So one major thing we want to do, aside from founding the society, um, is still bringing people together in these kind of workshops and potentially do something like train a trainer 
So if I develop a new tool and then can train other trainers in training people in using the tool, uh, the dissemination is like from, from some perspective optimal. Um, so because you, you, you share training materials, that's what I do all day on Twitter and GitHub and whatnot. Um, and in that way, I can avoid that other people develop the same thing again. <laughs> um, so that is one of the major purposes of Subias that we can bring the trainer together to exchange among each other to find common solutions for pretty normal like problems which happen everywhere. Um, and then we have, would we all would have time to develop new things and to develop new training materials that would make our life easier. So, Robert, while I whilst I have you, because we have just got a few minutes left, I have one picture that I managed to talk out recently. <laughs> Look, I, I I don't I don't stalk people with pictures, but I did have just one picture of you, Robert. Um, oh God, <laughs> which, which is this one? Yes. Uh, <laughs> if I position myself correctly, it looks like uh, Martin's actually awarding you me. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> so what? Do this this award was only recent. So what is the award that you're being given here? And so that's the, the, the data analysis and imaging award from the Royal Microscopy Society. And what's not in the picture, what also makes me very proud, actually, I got it together with Pete Bankhead. So Pete got his award the day before for a very similar reason. I got it. Um, it's because we, we we have like a lot of online materials where we where we train, where we where we allow others to to learn image analysis. We both are very active on the image science forum, image.fe, and we answer questions. So we are accessible and uh, help the community in a, on a global scale. And I think that's what Pete and me got this prize for. It also makes me really like super proud to get it together with Pete because we have sort of very similar mindset in this particular context. I think that's a really important side. I, so this just shows how far you know, Cody, you were back there, right back in the, the early noughties. Robert, you started, what, mid-noughties in this area. Elna's into the tens, I guess, into this environment. Yeah. Just how much it's developed in the recognition and importance of the work that there are now, you know, prizes, uh, recognition of the amount of work and how much that is needed and appreciated by the core facilities. But actually, now I'll take, I did say I had a picture of you, Kota. If we go back in time, to actually that conference you suggested. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's a picture of you going to, uh, in the Rail Museum in York. Uh, I remember that exceptionally well because I, I so you've got Al Alison North actually, so podcast guest uh, in the early stages with Kurt Anderson, but also the Beena podcast. Chris Power, uh, who you'll recognize by Red Things. Uh -huh. Uh, through yeah. and of course Kota himself but Kota was also infamous at Elmi and actually Robert and Elnaz I bet you have no idea of this uh, on the banquet evenings uh, Kota would generally bring together the organizers so this is me and Joe Marison and would sing oh, and mm. would sing oh. uh, to the whole to the whole crowd wherever the <laughs> banquet was so this is awesome. actually Kota singing uh, with me and Joe uh, having no choice but to stand there next to him listening to Kota sing. Kota, what was the song? What what did you actually sing? Yes, I don't remember. <laughs> but I think, so in this occasion, I would say that was uh, Will Me Daruko. It's a Japanese song. <clears throat> I think it was Japanese, right? Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, so I was, uh, at this time, so among less... Uh, Especially like a Julian and other these Embo people, um, we are often singing this song, and then uh, that was a uh, <laughs> uh, one of this. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was a uh, yeah. I remember I was singing in the because this is a train museum, right? Yes. The yeah. Coach, a lot of coach, old coach, and then uh, so I think this is a very good uh, resonance to be there. So I decided to sing her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly one of those unforgettable moments. Uh, as for the looking at what I was wearing, that just dates us right back. And actually, I, I, I didn't look that young then either, which is worrying, really. But before we go, because we, we've gone past the hour, I do need to just mention the importance of funding for new bias, new bias and whatever the new iteration will be. And so who is funding that at the moment? 
<laughs> we were we were very happy that we acquired funding from the Chan Burger Burger Initiative, um, who is paying us now for the next two years. Um, so uh, we are lucky that we can hire a person full time working on us with us as a community manager. Um, and additionally, we will have some funding for for organizing these trainer trainer workshops I mentioned earlier. Um, for getting people there, in particular people from from countries outside Europe, so it doesn't make sense that we fund me visiting Heidelberg, that is like not necessary, but getting people from South America, from Africa, for example, into our trainer trainer workshops would allow us to spread the word about how we organize this community, how we train, and then actually become a global become a global player. Yeah, and you know, I'm just thinking about it. Chan Zuckerberg Initiative gets mentioned so many times for different initiatives. But actually, I think you are possibly one of the best benefactors, not just from the funding of this, but maybe of the other things they're funded. Because by putting together an enabling BINA, Biomaging North America, Latin America Biomaging, maybe, to the African initiatives, you have all these, which means you now have points of contact to disseminate and to network in. Otherwise, actually getting to, to raise awareness that you exist for people to come and join across those other countries outside the elm is a great place in europe so you've got that potential but actually for the other parts of the world that's not so easy and czi putting these networks together actually means it accelerates what you can do even though the funding even without funding it just gives you a portal I, i've not really thought about that added benefit but that actually it's actually amazing how the Chan Zuckerberg initiative how they also shape themselves in their services over the years because they are not just a funding agency which drops money at you and wants to have a final report at some point no they they really from time to time reach out and you have zoom meetings with them and they ask you how can we help you so that you are successful and then through these discussions, there are these joint meetings the, the, with the other imaging communities uh, coming up, and this is how we connected each other. So it's like clearly the, the Charles Wagerberg initiative, who is really like making sure that we are successful with the projects we propose. And there is, to my knowledge, no other funding agency which works like that. And so... I, I, and thank you, Chan Zuckerberg, and all the other funders out there. I and mean, cost, you know, from the EU is it's so vitally important for that early stage uh, of, of what didn't feel like an early stage, but is now how it's growing. <clears throat> you know, that was a seed for a lot of this and all the volunteers' efforts. You know, all of you who put your time in at start quite often for free and finding added time, trying to balance that with your work life balances and everything else, actually. It, it's a community mm -hmm. that puts in and probably puts in more contribution than any one funder could ever put in. Uh, so there's a big thanks there. One final question I've got to ask, uh, starting with Elnaz, what's the best conference? <laughs> That's uh, me biased conferences, of course, because they're so biased. <laughs> Kota? New bias. Robert? Definitely. I would like to have this European wide new buyers conference back like on an annual level. At the moment, we are becoming a bit like too national, too regional from my perspective. I would like to have the big new buyers meetings back. Yes. Right. So that's something we've got to think about how to enable that and how where best ways of practice. Guys, it has gone over the hour. Actually, I've only asked half the questions I really wanted to find out. So I've got a feeling we might be revisiting this topic very soon. Uh, Robert, Elnaz, Kota, thank you for everything you've done uh, for the community and everyone else involved with New Bias and what they've done for the community and where it's going in the future. Thank you for everyone who's listened uh, or watched. Uh, it is worth watching, if not just to see Kota singing. Uh, and please don't forget to subscribe and listen back to all the other initiatives that are out there and people but please keep on doing what you're doing it's awesome and thank you very much for joining us today thanks for having us thank you thanks for support <laughs> thank you for listening to the microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by zeiss microscopy to view all audio and video recordings from this series please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the dash microscopists.